Welcome back. For our first substantive hour in this online course on the con on constitutional law, we're going to focus on the first sentence of the Constitution, uh, conventionally known as the preamble. I'm going to have a couple of 20-minute lectures, and then for our third session uh, in this hour, we'll do something a little more conversational and, and, and interactive. Um, so let's start with the, the words. This is how the written text, the terse text, begins. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. One sentence. And this, my friends, this one simple sentence changes everything. It's the pivot of world history, the hinge of history. Before this sentence, you have self-government, democracy, existing almost nowhere on planet Earth. In 1786, let's say the year before these words were, were up, up uh, first uh, printed up, you have who, who governs themselves across the planet? Well, to ex an extent, the, the British. Um, they have a House of Commons, after all. But they also have an hereditary monarch um, and an aristocratic House of Lords. But there's some self-governments in Britain. Um, you have a few sheep herders and goat herders in Switzerland who largely manage to govern themselves. And that's par partly because all the neighbors basically you know, leave them alone because it's hard to charge up a hill, and once you get to the top, there's nothing there. There's just, as I said, a few sheep and goats. Uh, so, but the Swiss are self-governing to some extent, and the British, and that's about it across the globe, outside of the United States. Uh, the rest of the world is ruled by, basically by thugs, by tyrants, kings, emperors, czars, sultans, Mughal lords, tribal chieftains. Uh, and so it had always been for millennia of recorded, millennia of recorded history. Self-government really um, had not been the dominant uh, mode of, uh, of uh, 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 society. Uh, you had in ancient Greece a few tiny city-states that, uh, like Athens, um, that for a moment, for a brief period of time, had managed to govern themselves, champion the idea of, of democracy pre-imperial Rome. But these city-states typically had, had not been able to defend themselves militarily. They had, they had, they had, the, the democracies, these republics, had blinked out after a time. And even when they existed, they existed only over a, a pretty small geographic area. People often meeting face to face, lived in a city, in a polis, together. They worshipped the same god or gods. They spoke the same language. They had a common climate and culture. So very little democracy um, in 1786 and in the history of the world up to 1786. Now think about today's world, the world of 2013, 2014. Democracy, self-government, this idea reigns over roughly half the planet um, by population and, and geography. Uh, uh, you have um, India, a billion people, largely self-governing. They've got a constitution and they've got elections and free speech and religious pluralism. You've got Eastern Europe. Uh, you've got Western Europe. Now, where did this idea come from that people across an entire subcontinent, there are lots of languages in India and religions and um, uh, ethnicities, that an, that an entire continent or subcontinent could actually be governed democratically? So that wasn't true of India in 1786. It's, it's controlled by the, by the British crown, by, by an unelected king. And today it's governing itself. Billion people. And as I said, look at Western Europe. France is governing itself. That wasn't true in 1786. They had pretty much a, you know, an absolutist monarch on the throne. You know, uh, 
Look at Germany. Look at Italy. They were not Poland self-governing in 1786, and they are self-governing today. What happened? My claim is what happened is the United States Constitution happened, a constitution that was born in an extraordinary democratic process up and down a continent. In 1787 and 88, we, the people of the United States, did ordain and establish a constitution. We did it democratically and continentally. As I said, people up and down a vast continent getting to vote on the basic ground rules of their society. They got to decide whether they were going to adopt this constitution or not. Ordinary farmers would got the chance to read this short document, short so that an ordinary farmer could read it in 1787-88. Think about it, talk with his, his neighbors, and decide whether he was for it or against it. That's the dramatic story of the preamble of the United States. We, the people of the United States, ordaining and establishing a constitution for our posterity. Never before in world history had so many people gotten to vote and talk about how they and their posterity would be governed. And the world would never be the same. It's the hinge of human history, at least secular history. If you happen to be a Christian, you think that the world is divided between B.C. and A.D., that that's the hinge. From a secular point of view, we can also talk about B.C. and A.D., before the Constitution and after the document. This document, the United States Constitution, gives us our modern world, a democratic world, a, a, a pluralistic world, a world in which the idea of self-government is, is now on the, the ascendancy. Uh, uh, we won, the, we, uh, the American idea of self-government, won the last century, the 20th century, and I like our odds in the 21st century. But that wasn't foreordained. In 1786, as I said, there's not very much democracy in the planet, and there hadn't been for in recorded history. And today, there's a lot, and it's because of the United States Constitution, I believe, and it's because, in particular, of the story told in the first sentence of the Constitution. That's why we're going to actually spend a whole hour on a single sentence, the preamble, that first sentence that announces this epic constitutional project, we the people. That's the story for, for today's session. Um, so uh, I've encouraged um, you to think about images, the, the, the pictures that, that, that are associated um, with each of these lectures. Each of these pictures is taken from the book America's Constitution and Biography. Each chapter uh, begins with a picture. You have the p picture on your screen of, of, of the, uh, uh, of the, you have the image associated with the, the preamble. Let's, let's look at this together and think what the themes uh, here are, what, uh, how this picture uh, tells a story worth a thousand words. This picture is taken from a newspaper, the Pennsylvania Packet and Daily Advertiser. It's taken from September 19, 1787. That is two days after the Philadelphia Convention has ended. I begin my story. I want us to begin our a, a journey through the Constitution after the Philadelphia Convention has ended, in a way. Why then? Why do we start our story then, on September 19th, rather than that long, hot summer in Philadelphia you've heard so much about from May through September with these delegates led by George Washington, um, who presided. Um, ben Franklin was there. James Madison was there. Alexander Hamilton was there for... for uh, some of it, for some of the most important parts of it. You've heard about that long, hard summer in Philadelphia, um, and that's not quite where we're starting our story. We're starting our story on September 19th. Why? Because that, when the Constitution went public, when this proposal that was hashed out behind closed doors in Philadelphia by a small group of people, mainly lawyers, um, but, uh, but what happened in Philadelphia over that summer was just a plan, a proposal that was, that was uh, put together, but it, it wasn't yet 
public. It wasn't yet the law. What made it the law was we, the people of the United States, over the next year, agreeing to ordain and establish it, to vote for it, to make it binding law. And that process, that year, a year that, that changes everything in world history, begins on September 19th, 1787, when for the first time the document goes public. It's published by a publisher, a newspaper publisher, uh, many across the continent. And the word publish, to make public, is the same root word as people, same root word as republican government. It's an idea of people power, making something public, making it available to the people. And the publishers don't have to, they, they get to decide what they publish. They, they are, they, we have a free press, and they think this is big news. And they publish the whole plan, the proposal. And what do they do? They highlight. The Pennsylvania packet is actually published in Philadelphia, and they print this proposal because it's short enough to be printed in a newspaper, short enough for ordinary people to be able to read it from start to finish. And the publishers understand that that preamble is important. They, see how they put it in bigger type? They see the headline. Publishers are good at it. They understand what the headline is. And the headline is, we the people. We're going to get to decide whether we ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States or not. This is way more democratic than anything that's previously happened in world history. That's ma the main theme of today's talk, of this, of this lecture. We, the people, indeed. Yes, indeed, they are actually doing something. We, the people of the United States, dot, 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 do ordain and establish this Constitution. Well, what did they actually do? Here's what they did. They talked and they voted over the next year, beginning in September, mid-September, 1787, 13 Individual states had special elections, state by state, creating these special conventions of the people, these special assemblies of the people. And the, each assembly had one task only, these conventions, to discuss the Constitution and at the end decide whether they were going to vote for it or not. And it wasn't going to go into effect unless nine of the 13 states said, yes, we do. Now, who, and that's, that's the dramatic story of the preamble, the people actually ordaining a constitution. That's news. Why is that news? Because that hadn't happened before in world history. Even the few democracies, republics, self-governing societies that had existed before, 17, before the American Revolution, let, let's say, um, even though ancient Athens had a democratic constitution, and indeed a written one, the Cleisthenic Constitution, it had not, that Constitution hadn't been adopted in this dramatically democratic way. It hadn't been put to a, a broad popular vote. Until the American Revolution, wh whatever self-governing societies existed, they either didn't have written constitutions at all, they just had some traditions and customs um, that sort of evolved, or if they did have a written document, it hadn't been put before the people um, for them, ordinary farmers, for them to, to um, vote on it. In, in Athens, for example, the lawgiver, Solon, hands down the law to the people. It's not voted for as a piece of paper by the Athenians. So never in the ancient world was there a, de a fully democratic constitution-making process. And uh, the American Revolution in 1776, the Declaration of Independence, wasn't put to a popular vote. Um, and none of the state constitutions in 1776, as the former British colonies became independent states, none of those was put to a popular vote in 1776. The British constitution had never been so called. Um, it's not a written document. It's not one. Th uh, th the British constitution is all the customs and practices and traditions and institutions that had never been reduced to one single document and adopted by parliament, much less the British people. So, so th 
this is a pretty new idea under the sun, to put all the basic ground rules into a single document that an ordinary person could read and then put it to, in effect, a, um, a special vote. And the publishers understand that's a big deal. They, they see it from the beginning and they, and they highlight the, the words of the, uh, of the preamble. Uh, now, in 1780, the Massachusetts Constitution had been put to a, pop, uh, a popular vote. And, and in 1784, uh, New Hampshire had done the same. But now what's being done is this is being done on a continental scale. So these little dress rehearsals at, um, in Massachusetts and, and New Hampshire are now being, being um, imitated on a continental scale. And here's a big point. And the text doesn't quite tell you this. You need to know some history. In eight of the 13 states that ratified, uh, eventually ratified the Constitution, that ordained and established it, in eight of the 13, ordinary property qualifications were lowered or eliminated. So people who ordinarily couldn't vote for state legislature were allowed to vote for convention delegates. Or people who weren't ordinarily allowed to serve in state legislatures were allowed to serve in, as convention delegates. So a much broader participation base than ever before. Um, it's, it, and it's explosive. It, it creates really, as I say, the modern world. Uh, think about it. Up and down the continent, people getting to vote. And not just vote, but talk. You can, they deliberated for a year. This is in the press. Some people are for the thing. Some people are against it. And no one is shut down. You can criticize George Washington if you like. You can support George Washington if you like. A massive outpouring of freedom of speech, an embodiment of freedom of speech. That hadn't happened in 1776 really. In 1776, the British crown, um, uh, monarch had, had, had sent um, already 30,000 troops uh, over to uh, America. They were about to land. And, and you were either for the revolution or you weren't, for independence or you weren't. And if you weren't, basically you were told to shut up or leave because this, this, this wasn't a philosophy seminar. This was war. And, and you either you know, had to sort of be for independence or fade away. No one who opposed independence in 1776 goes on to be an important political figure in independent America. You're sort of voted off the island. But in 1787-88, in this year that changed everything, this preamble year, there were people who opposed the Constitution vigorously. And they weren't voted off the island. Some of them would later become presidents of the United States, James Monroe. Vice presidents, George Clinton, Elbridge Gerry, justices on the Supreme Court, uh, uh, Samuel Chase. So um, uh, it's, it's an extraordinary deed, this we, the people of the United States, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Uh, the fix wasn't in. In some states, the Constitution was actually voted down. North Carolina votes it down initially in this year. Rhode Island votes it down. When George Washington takes office as the first president of the United States, only 11 states have said, yes, we do. Um, and the other states would join later after a Bill of Rights. Where do we get the idea of a Bill of Rights, for example, after a Bill of Rights had been proposed? We get it from these 13 ratifying conventions. Because when you bring people together and you allow them to talk, you're, in effect, crowdsourcing the, um, the, the Philadelphia draft that it had emerged. And, and in effect, the people, state by state by state, looked at this piece of paper and said, dudes, where are the rights? You forgot the rights. The Bill of Rights comes from this preamble process. We, the people, up and down the continent, deciding whether we're for it or against it. And yes, we're for it, but we can improve it. It needs to get better. We, we need to add uh, a, a Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights, in effect, it's, it's, it's almost like... Um, a wiki or something, a version 2.0 of the Constitution is crowdsourced in the ratification process. And the Bill of Rights that emerges is a Bill of Rights that will feature the words, the people, in no fewer than five of the Ten Amendments. You'll see that phrase, the people, in the First Amendment, the right of the people to petition and assemble. And in the Second Amendment, the right of the people to keep and bear arms. And in the Fourth Amendment, and the Ninth Amendment, the Tenth Amendment. Why is it saying the people, the people, the people, the people, the people in the Bill of Rights? Because it's coming from the people. It's coming from this preamble process, a process that was radically inclusive and democratic for its 
age. Now, yes, there were some exclusions, and I'm going to talk about those in uh, the next lecture. Um, try to put them in some context. There were some property qualifications in some places. Of course, women didn't vote. We're going to have to talk about slavery a lot in this course, and I promise you we will. But for now, I just want to um, end with a, a couple of observations just about how, in its context, if you look at, if you judge this deed in 1787-88 by the standards of 1786 and 1785 and the world that had preceded it, it's the most democratic deed in the history of planet Earth by far. I want to end this lecture by reading to you um, what the man who actually drafted these words, we the people at Philadelphia, had to say. Um, his name is James Wilson. He was an immigrant kid from Scotland, a scholarship kid, comes to America, becomes America's greatest lawyer. He will uh, be asked by George Washington to be a justice on the Supreme Court, the first Supreme Court. He will found the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Um, and he drafts these words in um, uh, uh, Philadelphia, we the people. And when the thing is finally ratified um, a year later, July, and he's speaking on July 4th, 1788, after at least nine states have said, yes, we do. Here's what he says. Um, to um, 10,000 people gather, gathered to celebrate in Philadelphia. The spectacle which we are assembled to celebrate is the most dignified one that's yet appeared on our globe, namely a people, free and enlightened, establishing and ratifying a system of government, which they previously considered, examined, and approved. You've heard of Sparta, of Athens, of Rome, You've heard of their admired constitutions and their high-priced freedom. But did they ever furnish the world an exhibition similar to that which we now contemplate? Were their constitution framed by those who were appointed for that purpose by the people? After they were framed, were they submitted to the consideration of the people? Had the people an opportunity of expressing their sentiments concerning them? Were they to stand or fall by the people's approving or rejecting vote? The people, the people, the people. You see here an early um, version of the Gettysburg Address. We've created a government of the people, for the people, from the people. The people are getting a chance to ordain and establish this Constitution, and the world will never be the same.